In this video, we're going to take a convex and a concave mirror. And then we'll take an object and we'll move it at different locations. And we'll find out what will happen to its images, where its images will be, what will be the nature of the image, and all of that. So let's begin with a concave mirror. And let's start with an object which is placed far away, far uh, uh, behind or beyond the center of curvature of this mirror. To figure out where its image is going to be, all we have to do is pick a point on this object. So let's pick the topmost point. Pick a point on this object, draw a bunch of rays of light from this, which goes and hits the mirror, and see what happens to them after reflection. You see, this point is emanating, is giving out rays of light in all the directions. We'll pick a few, which will go hit the mirror and see what happens to them. If we take any random ray, it becomes difficult to trace that. We, like for example, if you take a random ray that goes and hits over here, then it'll become difficult to figure out what the angle of incidence is and to figure out what the angle of reflection is and to draw that. But if you pick few particular rays, as we'll see, it becomes easier to trace them. So one of those rays that we're gonna draw over here is the one that goes parallel to the principal axis. The reason we picked this is because we already know what happens to this ray. All parallel rays which hits this mirror goes through the focus after reflection. So, this ray has to go through the focus after reflection. So this is one. This is one. Another ray we can draw through the focus. Or maybe we can also draw another ray through the center of curvatures. They will also do. But I usually like to draw another ray of light which goes, which is targeted at the pole. So let's draw a ray that is shot all the way from here and goes to the pole. I'll tell you why I do that. I like this because, because you see the principal axis forms the normal at the pole because the, the principal axis passes through the center of curvature and so we can easily see the angle of incidence. And so after reflection, the ray of light will just go somewhat like this, keeping the angle of reflection the same. So it goes somewhat this way. There we have it. So the two rays, incident rays, after reflection, intersect at this point. In fact, guess what? If we were to draw more incident rays, then it would look somewhat like this. If you were to draw more incident rays, I had, it'll take more time, but if you did it, then you'll find something like this, all right? The picture looks scary, but what's important is that all those rays are noticed being focused at this particular point, the point of intersection. All of them intersect at that same point. And as a result now, if we were to put a screen right at this point, the point where it's, all of them are being focused, then you will see a sharp image, a sharp image of this point over here. And you'll only get that at this point. If you were to put your screen over here, notice they're not intersecting at the same point and as a result you'll get a blur. And over here also notice you'll end up getting a blur. It's only at this point you'll get a very, very sharp image. So let's get rid of the screen. So to figure out where the image is formed, we need to figure out where all the rays are going to intersect. But since they all intersect at the same point, we don't need lots of rays. It's enough if we just draw two rays of light and that's why we're going to ignore the rest of them. And so we can comfortably say now that the image of this point is going to be at this point over here. So we'll find an image over here. And similarly, if you were to take another point on this object and draw the rays like this, you would see they will get focused somewhere over here. And another, another point over here would get focused over here. This bottommost point on the principal axis would get focused right at this point over here. And as a result, we could now say that we could now construct this image. The image would look somewhat like this. And again, if we were to bring our screen, we can capture this on our screen, which means notice we're getting, first of all, the image between F and C. It's inverted. It's real because we can capture it. Any image that can be captured on a screen or which is being focused is called real and it's diminished in nature. Here is that exact setup. We have the concave mirror. This dude in the phone is acting like the object and we have the screen. Notice that the object is kept far away from the center of curvature. And if you if we now draw rays of light from here, they're gonna get focused. I've kept the screen such that it's focused right at that point and we can actually see its image over here. And so if we dim the lights, so there's a screen, if we dim the lights, notice you can see a beautiful inverted image, a sharp image that is being focused at this point. This is really cool stuff. 
If you were to directly look at these rays by keeping a giant eye over here, then your brain will tell you that these rays are emanating from this point and as a result you can actually see that with your own eyes or with a camera. And so here it is, if we directly look into the mirror also, we can see that real inverted image. And that's smaller in size, it's diminished. Alright, now using the same technique, let's see what happens if we were to bring our object closer. Let's say we were to bring our object somewhere over here. What would now, where would now the image be? I want you to pause the video and try to draw a ray diagram yourself for this. All right, for me it's very easy to do this on the app. First of all, notice the parallel ray is gonna look exactly the same. The only thing I have to do is get rid of this part over here. But look at the ray that is being focused right at the pole. This ray now starts making a bigger angle at the pole. Can you see that? Because it, it, it originates from here. So the angle of incidence at the pole has increased. And as a result, the angle of reflection will also increase. So the reflected ray will go somewhat like this, somewhat like this, right? And as a result, the rays are now intersecting at this point. That means to obtain a sharp image, I have to move my screen away from the mirror. And so my image, as a result, we could now say, is also moving away from the mirror. But notice the image is now getting bigger because the top part is over here and the bottom part would be over here, so the image will be now this big over here. Again, we can see that over here, as we move the object closer to the mirror, notice we have to move the screen backwards, av away from the mirror, can you see that? And the image is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, I hope you can see this. If we continue this and let's say we bring our object right at C, now the image will be formed at C at C, they'll meet each other. The beauty of this part over here is that you will find that the image height will be exactly the same as the object height. Here it is, the object is right at C and notice the screen is right below it. And again, you can notice that the two have exactly the same size. Let's bring the object now even closer. Let's say we keep it between F and C, somewhere over here. Well, now if you draw the ray diagram, We'll find that all the rays of light is going to intersect over somewhere over here beyond C. So our image will be beyond C and it will be huge. It will be humongous in size. Again, let me show you that. Now the object is between F and C and where is the screen? Well, now the screen has to be behind. Over here. And again, if we dim the light, there it is. Look at that beautiful magnified inverted image. That's just beautiful, right? And the closer you bring this, farther the image will be and the bigger it will be. Eventually, we can bring our object right at the principal focus. Right at the principal focus. And now you will see that the two rays become exactly parallel to each other and as a result, they will never meet each other, which means you will never see an image. There is no image anymore. Some people like to say there is now image is formed at infinity, at infinitely far away. So at the principal focus, no image is formed. But you know what? We don't have to stop there. We can go even further and bring this object between P and F, somewhere over here. Well now, the rays of light after reflection are being divergent. They are going away from each other. Which means, again, there'll be no real image formed. You cannot capture this on a screen because it's not being focused. However, if you were to keep a giant eye somewhere over here, you see, your brain will tell you that these two rays of light are emanating from somewhere back over here. So if you were to move this thing a little bit, since the two rays are divergent, it, as, it, it appears as if the two rays are appearing from somewhere over here. That's what your brain will tell you. Your brain is being fooled into thinking like this. And as a result, what will now happen is that you will see the image of this point at somewhere over here, somewhere over there. Similarly, if you were to take the image of this point, it'll appear to be somewhere over here image of this point on the principal axis will be appearing to be somewhere over here. And as a result, your brain will tell you that these rays of light are emanating from back over here. Even though in reality they are not, notice that the rays of light are not really originating from this point, they're actually originating from here. That's what your brain will tell you. And as a result, even though it's not real image, you can still see it. So we call this as a virtual image. You can think that one is that it's erect in nature, notice. It cannot be captured on a screen. It's magnified. 
That's another property, it's magnified compared to this. And it's called virtual because the rays of light are not really emanating from this point, it just appears to be emanating from that point over there. Again, we can see that. Notice over here, now I have brought the object very close to the mirror inside the principal focus. And as a result, we will see first of all there is no screen, the screen is no longer needed. But now, if you directly look into the mirror, you can see a giant virtual image, look at that. See here, you can clearly see the erect image. It is no longer inverted, and that's a giant image can be seen. So concave mirrors can produce magnified virtual images, and this is why they're used as shaving mirrors or makeup mirrors. And as the object gets closer, you'll find the image stays virtual, it comes closer, but a little less magnified. So this is the story of concave mirrors. The key summary over here would be something like this. As long as the object is outside the principal focus, the image will be real. Inside the principal focus, it's virtual. And closer the object it is to the principal focus, bigger would the image be. And I, won't, I don't wanna write this down because I don't want you to remember this. All of this stuff can be worked out just by drawing ray diagrams. So now let's quickly go ahead and do cases for convex mirrors. Here it is. The only difference now is that this is the reflecting side, and as a result, we'll have to move our object on this side of the mirror, somewhere over here. And now, to figure out what will happen, where the image will be, we're gonna do the exact same things. So again, it'll be a great idea to pause the video right now and try to do this yourself first. All right, let's draw one ray of light from the top of this, which goes and hits the mirror parallel to the principal axis, and we know what's going to happen. This ray will not go through the focus like this, it doesn't go into the mirror, but it appears as if it's emerging from the focus. So it's, it's, gonna, get, it's gonna go up this way, and it's gonna appear as if it's gonna start from here. So I'm gonna start this all the way from here, let's do that. It appears to start from here. And then one more ray of light, we are going to shoot straight at the pole. Same thing, exactly the same thing over here, at the pole. And this ray, well, this is the angle of incidence, so the angle of reflection will be exactly the same. So what we find after reflection, the two rays are diverging away from each other, which means no real image, but if we kept our giant eye over here, I'm not gonna keep that now, but you can imagine a giant eye, then the brain will tell you that these two rays are emanating from somewhere over here. It appears to be coming from somewhere over here. And as a result, you will see the image of this over here, you end up with a virtual image, and the whole thing will be constructed like this. And so you end up with a virtual image which is diminished in size and between the pole and the principal focus. And what's something that you can confirm is, regardless of where you keep this object, you will always get a virtual diminished image when it comes to a convex mirror. Since I didn't have a convex mirror, I went to a parking lot and looked at the image of a parked truck. Look at the image of this parked truck carefully and you can see that the image of this truck is smaller in size. And in fact, because this is, the images in the convex mirrors are smaller, you can fit more of them, and as a result, you can see more in this mirror. And that's why these mirrors are used usually in parking lots to see around the corners. So the super duper final key summary of all of this is that don't ever remember any of these cases. If you're ever tested in any of this, all you have to do is draw ray diagrams and you can figure out all the properties of the images.